and that uh, the next morning, Francis Scott Key uh, wrote those lyrics which became known as our Star Spangled Banner, that uh, the, the whole point was, our flag was still there. Oh, what a night. Now, now before that, it was midnight of April 18, 1775, that Paul Revere made his midnight ride, crying out, the British are coming, the British are coming. Oh, what a night for the Patriots. Now, prior to that, it was on midnight, December 16, 1773, that the Patriots disguised themselves as Mohawk Indians, boarded three British ships, and uh, threw overboard 342 chests of tea into the Boston Harbor that became known as the Boston Tea Party. Oh, what a night. Now, before that, it was midnight, the month of Abib. How many of you know what Abib is? That's on the Hebrew calendar, okay? The month of Abib, it also went by the name of Nisan, okay? I know that's what you normally think of a car, but the, the month of Abib was Nisan. Now, on the 14th day of the month, 1440, oh, what a night. This was a night of great independence and deliverance and freedom. There was never a night like this one. But let me first just, uh, just do a little recollecting here about what we covered last time. Moses has been going in before Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. Pharaoh, uh, if you don't, Pharaoh, this is what's going to happen. He tells him what's going to happen. Pharaoh says, I don't know your Lord. I'm not doing it. He refuses. Well, the plague that Moses predicted would happen hits them. Boom. They get the plague. He goes to, he says to Moses, whoa, whoa, stop the plague. Pray to the Lord, stop the plague. If you recall last time we looked at the frog plague, you know, and uh, he said, I just would like to spend one more night with the frogs. All right? And, and uh, so the next day Moses prayed and the frogs were gone. The plague ended. But Pharaoh hardened his heart. And this cycle goes around ten times. Nine of them have already been co covered in, 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 in our message last week. But now we get to one that I call as the camelback breaker. You know what I mean? The straw that broke the camel's back for Pharaoh. I mean, this plague is the one that pushes him over the top, that he's finally going to let the people go, give them their independence and freedom, although he's going to have later regrets and wish that he hadn't. And this is the one that does it. It is the final cycle of ten. It's one that's been predicted from chapter 4, verse 23, that this one is so severe that Pharaoh is going to push you out of the land. He can't wait to get rid of you. Then Pharaoh said to Moses, Get away from me. Take care that you do not see my face again. For on the day that you see my face, you will die. That was after the ninth plague. Total darkness for three days. They all couldn't go anywhere. Because it was a darkness that you could feel. You could almost cut it with a knife. It was so thick. And he said, now get out of my presence. I don't want to ever see you again. And Moses said to him, just as you say. I will never see your face again. That's what you want. You have it. Then the Lord said to Moses in the very next chapter, 11th chapter, I will bring one more plague, plague number 10, upon Pharaoh and upon the, on Egypt, and afterward he will let you go from here. Indeed, he will let you go. He will drive you away. He, will, he, he wants you out of here. This one is the one I call, oh, what a night. Oh, what a night. Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight, you say about midnight, I will go through Egypt. And he goes on, he says, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, to the firstborn of the female slave who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the livestock. Listen, if it's firstborn, it's going to die. In another place, God had said in chapter 4, because Pharaoh would not let my firstborn go, because he called Israel his firstborn, Pharaoh will lose his own firstborn. 
of the sun. Oh, what a night. I call it Oh, what a night because it was a night of deafening crying. Now, if you're filling out the forms, you, the, 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 the back of the bulletin, you're going to notice that I got the wrong letter there. I got an S instead of a C. Typo. Okay. Goes to show that even the preacher makes mistakes. <laughs> But it was a night of deafening crying. Then there will be a loud cry. I know it's like to cry. The last couple of weeks I did more crying than I did in my whole life altogether. When I lost my my younger brother, okay. There will be a loud cry throughout the whole land of Egypt. That's a hate. Death is going to strike every home. It's such as never been or ever will be. Judgment is coming. That is not a politically correct thing to say today. <laughs> that God is holy and he's just. The soul that sins shall surely die. As Amos said, prepare to meet your God. Moses has been warning him. The day is coming. There will be another, another, never another day like this one again. A day of definite, definite crying. On the other hand, I find that it is a night of eerie silence. Verse, verse 7 says this. But not a dog will growl at any of the Israelites not at the people, not at the animals, so that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. Can you imagine the entire land, all the Egyptians, every home, there's wailing, there's crying, there's screaming, there's moaning, and a dog won't even bark or growl in Goshen with a rat. There is going to be no pain in any of their hearts. And he's got tucked right in here because the Lord makes a distinction. This is so important. God distinguished between Cain and Abel's offering, the one he accepted, the one he rejected. God made a distinction between Noah and his family and the rest of the world. The rest of the world perished, Noah was saved. God made a distinction between Abraham. He called him out of Ur of Chaldea and said, I'm going to bless you. Through you, the whole world will be blessed. He made a distinction between him and what became known as Gentiles. He's saying right now, I make a distinction between Israel, my firstborn, and all the Egyptians. I make a distinction. God still makes distinctions between the just and the unjust. There's the lost and there's the saved. There's the unrighteous and the righteous. There's those who know the Lord and those who don't know the Lord. The Lord makes a distinction. God wants us to know he makes distinctions. He knows those who are his and those who are not. And he says, it was a night so that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between those who are his and those who are not. It was a night of innocent slaughter. A night of innocent slaughter. He says, tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of the month of Abib, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. Now, I somehow dropped the next slide, but it's the same picture. But the next slide talks about, this is on the 10th day. But on the 14th day, you are to take that lamb. For four days, you set it apart. You examine it. You make sure that it's, it's perfect. There's no flaws, no blemishes. You're not going to give to the Lord something, your second-rate your second animal. Oh, I was planning to get rid of it anyway. And now we do it like the, remember the old days they had the mission barrel? And after you got done wearing something, you throw it in the mission barrel, it's good for the missionaries. Second rate. No, no, none of that. You give the very best. So make sure that on the 10th day you set it apart, you look at it, you prepare it, because on the 14th day, here's what the text says, you slaughter it. 
Now, slaughter it just means you take its life because you're going to make a meal out of that. That lamb is going to be a meal for you. And if you've got a neighbor and they're too poor to have a lamb, then, then you're going to share it with your neighbor. And, and everybody's going to meet in one house and you're going to have a meal with that lamb. And he says, you're going to take that lamb, you're going to slaughter it. The lamb was the innocent one who dies in place of the firstborn for the people of God, for Israel. As I go on in the passage, it says, and they shall take some of the blood. He goes on and tells specifically how you do this. You take a hyssop branch, you dip it in the blood of that lamb, and you take it and you put it on the two doorposts, both sides of the door, and you put it across the, the little post over the top, and he says, you do that where you're going to eat the meal. You put the blood of the lamb on the door. This is a secure Passover because watch what happens. None of you shall go outside that door of your house until the morning. For midnight morning, you, you stay in the house. For the Lord will pass through to strike down the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over that door, will not allow the destroyer to enter your house and strike you down. There's a song years ago, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass, I will pass over you. And that's what happened. They went out, they put the blood on it, they went inside, they had their meal, and where, where the blood was applied, the angel passed over. Now here, listen. Suppose you had been a Hebrew at that time, and you heard the instruction of Moses, and you got your lamb on the tenth day, and you watched it for the four days, it's perfect lamb, you slaughtered it, you, you, you had lamb chops, okay? And, and you, you had the blood, but you didn't put it on the door! You did everything but apply the blood. Do you know what happens? Death passes to your home. It's like the person I know who knows all about the Lord, but they've never applied the blood of Jesus Christ to their own life. You say, is there such a person? Yes, there are. When I was pastoring in uh, Philadelphia, uh, we were teaching evangelism and we were sending out our teams that had learned how to share their faith with people. Uh, actually, we had Bible school at the church. And to follow up on our Bible school, uh, I'd call up on the phone to the parents that sent their kids and say, hey, listen, I'm from the church and uh, we'd really like to stop by and visit with you and just tell you a little bit about what our church is all about. Would you be open to that call? And they would say yes. And, and then uh, we would send a team over to go and I'd say, listen, they want you to tell them about our church. Just go tell them about our church and share the good news of Jesus by telling about our church. And so uh, one of the men, uh, his name is Bill Kerr, and he goes to a house, uh, he knocks on the door, and the guy there says, uh, no, I didn't send my kids to the Bible school. And being a pretty bright kitty guy, did, Bill says, well, can I come in and tell you about our church? And so the guy, turns out he went to the wrong house, okay? And, and so he, he goes into the house, and he starts talking about church. It's just on the street from him. The kids in the neighborhood are walking to the, to the church. And so he, he starts to go through the, the gospel with this guy. And the guy had studied for the Episcopal priesthood. He could quote the prayers from the common book of prayers. He knew the theology. And the man he's talking with, is, his name is John Burke. And, and John is listening to everything he says, but later he tells me, after that night, he says, it's not what he said that was new to me. What was new to me is what it, I needed to personally ask Jesus Christ to be my Savior. You know what? Christ is our Passover that has been sacrificed. When he died on the cross, he shed his blood. The payment has been made. My friend John studied for the Episcopal priesthood. He, he knew the gospel, but bottom line, he said, I never applied the blood to my life. I never received Jesus Christ as my Savior. 
as long as it was just in the book, as long as it was just in my head, and it wasn't in my heart, he said, I was without Christ. He was like an Egyptian. No blood on the door. With condemnation on its way. My friend John was like that. He prayed and accepted Jesus. Now that guy got gloriously saved. And the next Saturday, we had a men's prayer breakfast. And at the men's prayer breakfast, John came in. We were sitting in the two front rows. All the men were there. And uh, when it came time to pray, John prayed. Blew everyone away because I mean, well, he studied for the physical priesthood. The guy knew how to pray. But all of a sudden, it was real. There was not a man there that didn't have a tear in his eye when he got done. Because you knew that he had found, finally, intimacy with God because he had applied the blood of the Lamb. You see, John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming to be baptized, said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And when Jesus died on the cross, he was our sacrifice. He was our Passover Lamb. And so when you accept Jesus as your Savior, it's applying the blood of Christ to your heart. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. So when God looks down and he sees that Jesus has applied his blood to our heart, he passes over us. So that Paul says, therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I will never, ever be judged for my sin because Jesus paid it all. I will never ever be condemned. I don't live in fear. I live in gratitude and praise. And I live every day saying, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. The blood has been applied. Condemnation jumps over me because it was taken by the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is our Passover man. He has been sacrificed. It was a night of universal sorrow. A night of universal sorrow. Pharaoh rose in the night. I don't know what awoke him. Maybe it was a gasping child. I don't know what it was. And he rose in the night. He and all his officials and all the Egyptians. And there was a loud cry in Egypt. For there is not a house without someone in it. Condemnation caught up with them, ended in judgment, and finally, Pharaoh is going to grant freedom. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron. Isn't it interesting how he went back on his word? You shall never come into my presence again. But then he summoned them. He summoned them as president and said, Moses and Aaron in the night, he said to them, Rise, go away from my people, both you and the Israelites. Go worship the Lord uh, as you have said. Now I skipped over the verses in this passage just to kind of condense the story, but the, the Israelites had asked and borrowed gold and silver from all the Egyptians, and they gladly gave it to them because the text says they profoundly respected Moses. So that when they actually leave the land, the Bible says they plunder them. You know what that was? That was payment for all their slave labor. <laughs> you see, God makes a distinction between those who are his and those who are not. They finally have freedom. I want to suggest this. My, my, my final thought here is this was a night of genuine faith genuine faith. The New Testament writer of the book of Hebrews says, by faith, Moses left Egypt. It was by faith. Nine times in a row, Pharaoh changed his mind. I'm not going to let your people go. But he believed that God was ultimately going to triumph here. He persevered. Listen, by faith, he left Egypt, unafraid of the king's anger. Listen, he was the messenger. Pharaoh's son was dead. If there's anyone he's going to be angry at, it's Moses. By faith, it says, he was unafraid of the king's anger. For he persevered as though he saw him who is invisible. 
Hebrews chapter 11 begins by saying, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He's saying, Moses had genuine faith. He didn't see God do this, but he believed that God would do it. It was as if he saw him, even though he didn't see him. He believed that he was there. He believed that he was going to pass through. He believed that if he applied the blood, as it goes on, by faith he kept the Passover. Tenth day, set that animal apart, slaughtered it. They made the meal. They all shared it. They had the blood sprinkled. That's what it goes on. He says he kept the Passover by faith. And by faith, he sprinkling the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. He believed. He applied the blood. He applied the blood of the Lamb. He believed. That's what we have to do. We must truly believe in Jesus as our Savior. So what do we take away from this? I want to take away from this that the New Testament declares that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It also declares that our, our Lamb has been sacrificed and that He is our Passover. And if we apply the blood, we accept Jesus as our Savior, God sees that and God passes over us with condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It's even better than that. 1 John 1, 7 says, The blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. From all sin. He passes over because there's nothing there to judge. It's all been taken by our Savior, the sacrifice. Here's really my final thought. Those who believe in Him, the Bible says, are not condemned. Right? They've applied the blood. It's kind of like Pharaoh. He didn't apply it. He didn't apply it. He was condemned. But those who do not believe, those who do not believe, are condemned already. Pharaoh stood condemned already. He was under the sentence. Because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. They have not believed. Everything comes down to have you applied the blood of Jesus to your life by accepting Him and His sacrifice as being your sacrifice? Is He your Savior? Because God is a God who distinguishes between His own and those who are not. My final plea is this. If you've never done it, believe today. Just believe today. How do I do that? It's real simple. It says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You just say, in a prayer, that's how we, we call on the Lord. You say, Lord, I need your blood applied to my heart to be my Savior. Save me, O Lord. I mean, he knows because it's the faith, not the prayer. You believe in your heart unto righteousness. You confess with your mouth unto salvation. So you believe it in your heart. You say it with your mouth. And he knows what you need. He saves you. The blood is applied. He passes over you. You are eternally secure in Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven. In just a moment, we're going to go to the Lord's Supper, which Jesus celebrated at a Passover meal. And yet Jesus, it says, is our Passover lamb who's been sacrificed. Perhaps there's someone here who has never really trusted in Christ, kind of like my friend John Burke. It's all in his head, but not in his heart. They know these truths, but they've never surrendered their heart to apply them to themselves. Right now, hear their prayer as they lift it up and say, O oh Lord, apply the blood of Jesus to my heart. Be my Savior, be my God. Save me, O oh Lord.
and the genuine faith like recorded in Hebrews. They do that, Lord. They are secured by the Passover Lamb, Jesus Christ, having taken their place. As we come to this table, Lord, it's to remind us that He is that Lamb. He took our place. His blood was shed for the remission of our sins. His body was given over as a substitute for us. Bless us, Lord, as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name, amen.